So, uh, as you heard, I'm Jay Jenkins. Um, I'm uh, really, truly excited to be here. Uh, I've enjoyed working on the robotic side and the human side and back to the robotic side. Uh, this, uh, this is just an amazing time uh, to be in a, in, uh, a position such as this. Uh, next uh, chart, please. Oh, I guess I do that. So you've seen this chart regularly, and uh, I don't want to belabor it other than to say, where are we, uh, this panel? All along the bottom, and we're starting out right here uh, with commercial lander and early South Pole crater rim missions. Uh, we are, we're, we're on the forefront here uh, to blaze the trail in order to support the, the human spaceflight activities. So this is really not an org chart per se, but it's more of a functional concept um, as well. Uh, the important takeaway here is, uh, and something that General uh, Lester uh, Lyles uh, mentioned earlier, is the concern about science and, integrate, uh, and exploration. We don't want to get the two lost. Now, back in the LRO 10 years ago, we had the expression that science enables exploration and exploration enables science. And that's something that we take very seriously. And that's why we have this Office of Exploration in the Science Mission Directorate. So Steve Clark is that Deputy Associate Administrator there. And within that activity, uh, we've got the Lunar Discovery and Exploration Program. And I'll talk about the content of that uh, a little bit later. But the important thing is the dotted lines, right? The dotted lines that reach back into technology, technology to support the science and exploration, the uh, actual activities of the human exploration, and reaching over into science, and particularly with the Planetary Sciences Division, uh, who had been managing LRO for the last 10 years. Um, and so, that integration function is absolutely key uh, to, to what we're trying to accomplish in, in uh, Steve Clark's office. So this is the content uh, that, we're, that we're covering just within that, that small office. Uh, you're going to hear about uh, uh, clips uh, from Camille, so I don't, I don't want to go into that too much. Um, but uh, it's uh, obviously a commercial service. It's, uh, it's taking a new way of approaching business. Uh, we, um, we, we want to take some risk. We want to get. Uh, we want to uh, develop a fledgling uh, uh, service, uh, lunar ser uh, delivery services community, uh, both from the supplier as well as the customer standpoint. Um, instrument payload development. We are trying to create a pipeline in order to be a good first adopter, and that's how we're. That's how we're seeding. Uh, the, the commercial um, payload services activities. Viper uh, is a relatively uh, new announcement. Um, that's the Volatiles Investigation Polar Exploration Rover. Uh, that leverages, heavily leverages, the uh, uh, resource prospector uh, engineering uh, that, we've, that we're in the process of archiving now. Um, but we're going, but unlike uh, resource prospector, uh, we're gonna be delivering that on Eclipse Lander. Um, and then we will anticipate uh, follow-on rover missions uh, every, couple, or every couple of years thereafter. And I'll talk a little bit more about that strategy. Then we had LRO, uh, we've got lunar small sats. Um, we've got the uh, lunar trailblazer, um, is one that the planetary science uh, is funding through phase AB, and then we'll pick it up between, uh, after phase CD. And the Apollo Next Generation sample analysis, uh, we're funding that. So CLIPS, we got nine vendors on board right now. Uh, there's an error on this chart here. We have an on-ramp activity. It is not currently open. It closed noon yesterday. Uh, so really excited to see what we got in terms of proposals there. Um, we have two uh, active task orders right now with Astrobotic and Intuitive Machines. And I'll let Camille talk more about that. The instrument pipeline. Uh, when we started out, of course, we wanted a fast cadence. We wanted to get to the moon quickly. Um, and so we are targeting uh, 2021 uh, presence, uh, robotic presence with the, with the two task orders that we have there. We did an internal call for NASA provided instruments. We got 13 instruments that we've already selected and they're working to be the payloads on the, on the first two. Uh, we've also done an external call for tech, uh, instruments that are near flight readiness uh, ready to go. We selected 12 of those in July. So we're, we're working. We're, we're, we've got contracts in place. We are developing missions and we are going uh, straight to the surface of the moon very shortly. Now future calls, we're anticipating doing external, combined external internal calls about once every year. And we are leaning toward 
away from the speed, you know, uh, we wanted to get there as quickly as we could, so we're flying what's available that gives value, right? But we want to start pulling in the PI-led activities, uh, targeted investigations, targeted locations, uh, and of course, opportunities for internationally provided payloads. Steve is uh, uh, dealing with uh, the Kerry folks, the ESA folks, JAXA folks, et cetera, et cetera, on a regular basis. So uh, in terms of science that we're, that we're anticipating, um, the polar uh, landers and rovers, very obvious uh, volatiles, as well as supporting the human exploration, nonpolar uh, as well. Uh, the clips will, will be able to have global coverage of the moon. There's a lot of interest in radio science on the, on the, uh, on the silent side, or the far side of the moon, um, young volcanic features, uh, and then the, uh, the swirls uh, uh, with the, uh, surface magnetic measurements that are right uh, in situ. Orbital data, that's another thing that we're looking at our, our CLIPS providers to be ultimately providing. Uh, as long as they're delivering things to the lunar surface, why can't they deposit us in lunar orbit? Uh, that's another awesome capability that we want to be able to procure on a service basis. And the important thing about this, this service model, it, it's so different that we don't own the infrastructure. We don't own the lander. We don't own the launch vehicle. We don't own the mission. We're literally buying a service. And I know that we talked about that before with commercial crew, commercial cargo, et cetera, but this is a little bit different because on all those others, NASA is the sole customer. And here we want to be a marginal customer. We're flying along with other folks who also bought a ticket. Uh, and on one of, uh, on, on the Astrobotic, uh, we're one of, what, 14-ish uh, customers uh, on board this. And so it's, it really is a shared ride. So the lunar mobility. So we're starting out with Viper. So we're leveraging the RP experience there. Um, and, of, and the uh, objectives are volatiles, right? I mean, we're talking, this is uh, the um, decadal science priority as well as a, a human exploration SKG priority. Um, this rover will, is anticipated to operate more than one lunar day. Uh, we're requiring that of it. And it's going to be developing resource maps, not only of the visited sites, but we're developing a partnership with USGS in order to apply the geostatistical methods. So we'll be able to map volatiles and water throughout the entire surface of the moon based upon this. Um, then from thereafter, we want to do this biannually, but we're in investigating multiple options. We don't know exactly how we want to do the rover uh, activity, and I think it's going to end up being a combination of all of these. So we have the NASA in-house development that we're using on Viper right now. Uh, we have to look into whether or not we can leverage things like Athlete and Mars rovers, et cetera. And of course, commercial mobility services. We've got the folks uh, that are um, doing the CLIPS activities. Um, we want, ultimately, it would be nice to buy mobility service, not just landing service. Commercial procurements, like we, more something that's more typical of what we do. Uh, international partnerships. And of course, we're trying to coordinate very closely with STMD. I just want to finish up here, um, Lunar uh, LRO, 10 years operating. Uh, the takeaway here is that we have been, you know, support, science and exploration have been in lockstep for a decade now, or mo actually more, but this is, this is living proof, and this is still going on, right? It, the mission is still functioning. And I want to show you the bottom takeaway. 1.1 petabytes of data to support human exploration. We know the surface of the moon better than any other body in the solar system, including Earth, because the Earth is covered up with all the, it has so many oceans, right? 1.1 petabytes. The entire uh, planetary data system is 1.7. We're approaching being two-thirds of the planetary data system. That's twice as much data as all other missions combined with this uh, one mission. And again, so LRO, they're providing support. They're providing support for the clip signers, looking at landing sites. Uh, they're also monitoring every landing that we have uh, or that, that uh, we've had thus far. Uh, and there we go. So with that, I think I went just a titch over, but not too badly. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Camille Elaine, uh, again, Deputy Manager uh, of the CLIPS Project. Um, and so I don't know if you want to do it from there or here. Or yeah. 
I think this works. Hi, good morning. Um, thank you, Jay. And thank you to the organizers for having me here. We're really excited about this project, uh, the Commercial Lunar Payload Services. Um, can we bring up the slides, please? Okay. I guess. Okay, great. So, as Jay said, this is a new way of doing business for NASA. We are literally buying a service, a FedEx or a DHL, to the lunar service, to the lunar surface. NASA wants to be a marginal customer. We are clear there's no marketplace right now, and um, we are currently the anchor customer, but we want to evolve this program into being the marginal customer, being one of just many um, customers that our vendors are servicing. We are sponsored programmatically and we get our funding through SMD from Steve Clark's organization. Many have asked where do we fit in, um, in the org structure. We managed a project from Johnson Space Center and we are located in the Exploration and Integration Directorate. Um, but we report directly to Steve Clark and his team. We are supporting NASA's science, technology, and exploration goals. And um, as Jay mentioned, we uh, awarded a master contract uh, last year in November um, to a vendor pool, and we asked them to safely integrate, accommodate our transport, our instruments, our scientific instruments, deliver it to the surface, and they are responsible for procuring their launch vehicle, for providing their la la um, lunar lander spacecraft, lunar systems, and any other services that are required to deliver our payloads successfully and safely to the moon. Uh, the contract, uh, we have nine vendors in the pool. It's an IDIQ contract. Um, again, these are the nine uh, companies that are currently on the master contract. It has an estimated maximum value of $2.6 billion, but each vendor is um, guaranteed a minimum of 25,000 for being on the contract for a specific deliverable that we have determined. Um, the contracting period is uh, 10 years. We have an on-ramping activity. Uh, we'll be doing this about every two years or as needed. Uh, we are actually currently, as Jay said, um, in the middle of uh, um, this activity, we closed our last RFP uh, yesterday, and so we're excited to see who um, you know, is interested in coming on board. The purpose of this is really for us to assess the market um, for enhanced landing capability. When we first started out, we were interested in delivering um, 10 to 50 kilograms to the learner surface. Of course, our project is evolving, and now we're going to bigger payloads, larger mass payloads, and so it was important for us to see what other um, you know, market uh, capabilities were out there. And so we are currently in that process. Um, we do not anticipate that we will be on ramping, though, um, any time after contract year eight. So in terms of the task order, so we have a master contract that the vendors are on, and each of those vendors are you know, required to um, compete on the task orders that we put out. That's really where the work is. Um, we issue these task orders on an as-needed basis. Um, they must respond, even if it's a no bid. Um, in the task order and the statement of work, we describe the criteria that they're going to be assessed on, the period of performance, the mission requirements uh, for us, NASA. They are competed, as I said, amongst all the vendors in the contract pool. And uh, May, the end of May, we issued our first lunar surface payload delivery task order. Um, we had 14 payloads that were solicited by SMD. These were uh, sponsored by across the NASA centers. Um, and the contractors were allowed to 
you know, do a grab bag approach. They were allowed to select any of those instruments that were compatible with their um, particular lander design. We selected, we actually selected three, um, uh, but now currently two are in the pool, Astrobotics, and you'll hear from them, and Intuitive Machines. For future task orders, we are moving towards, we're moving away from this grab bag approach, more towards a PI-led, PI-defined mission. They will define the, the they will select the, the instruments, define a mission, define location, and that the and we will put that on a task order. We're working towards flying, as, as Jay said, the NASA rover and instrument suite to the lunar pole, and that should be coming up in the next few months. Um, SMD selected 12 more science instruments we call LCID-P, lunar surface instrument and technology payloads, um, that will also go on an additional task order towards maybe the, the beginning of next year. We're intending for about two deliveries a year, so we're gonna be very, very active. And by the end of FY19, we anticipate we'll have six missions to the moon under contract, flying at least 30 NASA instruments. So we are very, very excited about this uh, project. Um, it's very, very dynamic. It's evolved from when it was first conceived to now and in the future, we, will, we have a lot of activity and I think our vendor pool is very excited about the opportunities to provide the service to NASA. And with that, I will hand it over to Sharon. Good morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Jay, to, to be on this panel. Um, I wanted to speak to before the slides. Can we have, can we have Sherrod's charts, please? We are here to make space accessible to the world. <clears throat> we are um, DHL to the moon, because DHL is our corporate sponsor. <laughs> <clears throat> we are a space robotics company. We were founded in 2007. We are based in Pittsburgh. Uh, we are a Carnegie Mellon uh, spinoff. Um, since our founding, uh, we have pioneered the end-to-end -end lunar delivery service uh, to deliver payloads uh, to the moon uh, and space mission critical applications. Uh, and we're very proud uh, that long before Eclipse was even introduced, uh, we had secured 12 commercial payload delivery contracts with customers around the world. Um, and this enabled us to start exercising our payload delivery, payload customer services model. Um, our first user's guide was issued in 2014. We had an interface definition document issued in 2015 and a payload integration plan in 2016. These have all been iterated progressively to uh, add uh, more fidelity so that our payload customers understand uh, what our service is and how uh, it can be procured. We have had a four-year partnership uh, with NASA through the Lunar Catalyst Program, uh, as well as a partnership with Airbus, and this has given us access to world-class engineering, uh, technology tools and services that have enabled us to, to advance our program uh, generate a great deal of program maturity and credibility uh, for our customers. <clears throat> uh, recently, we uh, announced that we signed a launch contract with ULA uh, to launch on Vulcan in 2019. Peregrine is our lunar lander. It's our flagship program for the company. It's what our company is focused on developing and delivering. Uh, it's one lander. It is capable of delivery to any destination on the moon and into lunar orbit, uh, deliver payloads into lunar orbit. <clears throat> um, we have designed our spacecraft to be low complexity but high reliability, um, minimal, minimal mechanisms and articulation uh, to keep it, uh, again, low complexity. Uh, we have a, an open payload deck um, design that's accommodate, uh, designed to accommodate a wide variety of payload types uh, with different form factors, different footprints, uh, and different operational requirements. So below on the uh, undercarriage of the spacecraft, we can mount uh, things like rovers that can deploy, 
On the upper side of the decks, we can uh, mount payloads that require booms to be extended, measurements to be taken, um, and acts or line of sight visibility to Earth and other celestial bodies. Uh, and we are open to the idea of accommodating uh, engineering models, uh, low TRL models, things that need to be delivered to the surface of the moon to gain TRL, uh, advanced TRL to a TRL nine, level nine. Uh, we do this uh, because we want to enable the science community to be able to send anything they want to the moon to test out a component, a particular uh, piece of equipment. Uh, we do extensive analyses on these payloads to make sure that they do not uh, create a harmful environment for the adjacent payloads and the adjacent customers, as well as the spacecraft. <clears throat> so this gives us maximum capability to support the, the science community. Uh, the impact of CLIPS onto Astrobotic is we won task order two to deliver payloads uh, to the lunar surface by December 2021. Uh, we selected the maximum number of payloads offered uh, by NASA because of the capability of the spacecraft. Um, this contract is really ideally suited for this public-private partnership model. Um, as I said, we had commercial partnerships uh, long before CLIPS. We had established a commercial pipeline, and so this uh, just augments that. <clears throat> um, our structure allows us to maintain our business model at risk posture. This is, as mentioned before, the FedEx, or in our case, DHL to the surface. Um, and that enables us to maintain our infrastructure, our processes, uh, and just deliver the payloads uh, per the customer's requirements. <clears throat> and it, it enables us to maintain the, our competitive uh, posture in the commercial market. Um, also, NASA's introduction of CLIPS and our ability to win the contract also gave us immediate credibility within the market uh, to our providers, uh, unlocking more commercial opportunities, sponsorship opportunities, as well as in our staffing approach, um, having a uh, world-recognized uh, NASA agency as NASA uh, on our customer list really enhanced our ability to find the top talent uh, to bring to Astrobotic. And with that, I'm going to go with Greg. All right. Thank you, Sean. Sure. If we could have uh, Greg's chart, please. Yeah, I think there, there they go. Okay, so we, we've seen this, this chart. I think Marshall presented it yesterday. And um, I wasn't able to be here yesterday, so I hope I don't repeat what uh, Marshall and uh, Smith and Lisa Watts Morgan said. Um, but uh, as Jay mentioned earlier, uh, across the bottom of that chart is, is what we're looking at. Uh, to follow up on what Sherrod was saying, the uh, Lunar Catalyst uh, partnerships that we've had with three companies over the past few years will end at the end of this month. Um, there, there's some that want to know why, since it was working so well, why, why end it? Well, um, it's because it was working so well that we've matured the uh, capabilities, as Sherrod was just showing in the case of Astrobotic. Um, and now we're ready to enter into that next phase of robotic uh, services to the moon. But what we bring forward from that is the experience of the partnership through Lunar Catalyst. Uh, we've looked at the commercial crew model as well. And so that model coming forward and how we partner with industry to develop uh, capabilities that are, that are industry-led and commercial capabilities is one of the things we're, we're bringing forward from what we've learned the past few years. Um, so I uh, also want to, uh, and, and this being under, under HEO, and I know uh, the, the rest of this is under Science Mission Director, but I want to acknowledge that uh, the Space Technology Mission Director, STMD, has been vital in uh, helping with the technologies that our Catalyst partners uh, have been using as well. And they, too, um, will be instrumental in how we go forward with partnerships uh, on, on the human landing system. Um, so. Uh, what's shown here over on the right-hand side, and, and we all know 2024 is, is the, the big date. Um, we, we don't have a specific day um, that, that's codified yet. Uh, we're targeting uh, sometime in the last half of, of 2024. That gives us a little more time. Um, but we see that uh, on, the, on this picture on the right-hand side, there's humans on the surface. Uh, what enables that? Um, you see on the left-hand side is what was alluded to earlier. There's several landed missions before we get there. Uh, these landed missions will demonstrate sensors, algorithms, uh, technologies, 
operational uh, approaches uh, to help us uh, verify and understand what it's going to take to, uh, to get humans to the moon uh, in 24. And, and, and we get asked sometimes why not uh, go do exactly what we did in, in Apollo. Well, there's a, um, uh, an approach that we're trying to do, and if you, oh, I got the next chart. So it's not just uh, 2024. There's also the second phase of this that, that picks up beyond that to get to a sustainable uh, capability. So we see that um, even beyond 24, there's CLIPS opportunities. Um, when we uh, realize the uh, opportunities from, from CLIPS to, uh, as Jay alluded to, and um, increasing capabilities from the, uh, from the commercial sector, um, and what's shown here are multiple rovers. There's multiple opportunities to deliver uh, payloads that uh, enhance, um, augment uh, the, the humans on the surface. And we, um, it, it's conceivable to develop a plan where we can um, in place uh, assets on the surface before humans go. Uh, we're running a lot in parallel uh, right now. Uh, for 2024, we, we're not um, uh, sure of all the capabilities that will be available then. Uh, so we're, uh, we're being agile enough to accept those uh, capabilities as they come online and, and, and assist us with the, uh, the, the human missions. So the, the topic of this was CLIPS to, to human missions. And in CLIPS, uh, C is for commercial. Um, and, and that's where uh, it, it is conceivable to have uh, commercial services for humans eventually. Um, and and that's, that, that's the end goal at the, at the end of the, uh, the decade. But how do we get there in 2024? We have to keep coming back to that. Um, uh, that's, a, that's a mandate that we're taking very seriously. So the approach that we have with, um, with that, and many of you are familiar with uh, uh, the next step Appendix E, uh, which came out before the Vice President's speech where we were uh, intending uh, to work with industry to develop capabilities for um, stages um, that, that uh, could be put together as a plug-and-play approach. Um, it was a good plan. Um, had a lot of industry involved. Uh, but then when the uh, uh, 2024 date came out, uh, we reassessed that and looked at uh, what it would take to get there. And programmatically, we had to streamline uh, a lot. And so we've ended up with um, uh, Appendix H, which is um, a draft that came out, second draft came out a few weeks ago. And so that's, um, and so we're working really hard to try to get that turned around. And it's, uh, it, we're, uh, we're, we're running really fast. It's uncomfortable for many of us, but we're excited about it. Um, and and uh, we, we intend to have that uh, out shortly. Um, so, uh, see, I'm going to cover a little bit about uh, Appendix H. It's, uh, uh, see, I think that's about all I can say about that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Greg. The lawyers are happy. Yeah. And Seamus. Uh, good morning. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to come uh, address uh, the folks. Put my slides up. I'm Seamus Tui. I'm Principal Director at Draper. I lead all of our civil and commercial space efforts. You know, I, I did a little retitling, you know, I, I took a little, I, I call it from Apollo to Eclipse because that's Draper's journey. Uh, we were the first prime contractor named on Apollo uh, back in the day. Uh, and we're an interesting company in that we're, a, we're an independent and not-for-profit. Uh, and so uh, it makes it kind of funny, you know, why, why are we then part of Eclipse that seems to be commercial? Well, we're still a commercial company. We just, we just operate at a not-for-profit basis. But like, about, like a lot of other companies uh, that have been involved in space, we have evolved in, in the type of work we do and the, in the business operations we do. Uh, and it's been a very good journey for us. Uh, you know, first on Apollo, we were a typical uh, government prime contractor, uh, the first one on Apollo. And that proceeded uh, through the decades. You know, but then when the public-private partnerships came out, we actually thought that we were uh, perfectly suited for that. It's become a very successful model <coughs> Uh, for us to pursue uh, being involved in uh, two commercial cargo uh, teams and also uh, all the other public-private partnerships that the uh, uh, NASA's put out, leading Eclipse, which is a really a, uh, more of a commercial uh, program. We were ready to bid Eclipse because we had actually just engaged uh, with a commercial uh, 
company uh, named iSpace, a Japanese company, uh, that is 100% commercial. Uh, they ha actually have received the largest uh, Series A funding round uh, in space of about $100 million. Uh, and so when Clips came around, we, we, we thought we were well positioned for that. Uh, maybe not as well positioned as the two teams who won, but uh, one of the things, we were not one of the first uh, two contracts uh, put out, but we're still part of the nine, and we still intend to uh, continue to bid to improve our proposals, improve our business models. Uh, we hope to be successful uh, in the next round or two. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, lunar lander development uh, at Draper. Uh, you know, when we did Apollo, we didn't forget about it. Uh, we continued a lot of our efforts. Uh, a lot of it were studies, uh, a continuous series of fresh starts. Uh, for those of you who have a long uh, history in space, probably longer than I, remember first Lunar Outpost and Lunar Scout and things like that. Uh, those kept us going, kept our interest, kept, kept our ability to develop new technology and new approaches uh, to primarily do navigation, uh, 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 to get to the moon to do precision navigation and safe landing, which led to, uh, we were one of the prime contractors on Project Constellation, uh, uh, the concept exploration refinement, so we had our uh, series of landers that we developed uh, for that. We did have a Google X Prize uh, team called Next Giant Leap, uh, which we were successful in uh, getting a few rounds. We were successful in getting the ILDD contract uh, for data, uh, but like a lot of the other teams, we were not successful in, in raising enough capital to, to make our, our mission. Uh, we took a lot of that work uh, and uh, brought it to uh, NASA programs. So we spent a lot of time over the next few years doing NASA development. Uh, uh, doing all hat program, the Autonomous Landing and Hazard Avoidance Technology Program. And then we had our own flight program called Genie, uh, which was uh, uh, through the Flight Opportunities Program. And I can't stress enough how, how beneficial that program has been uh, to companies like ours, and I'm sure other companies in the audience, that provides a, an opportunity to, to take technology that we've developed and actually get it to flight, a test flight. Uh, there's something about uh, the, the pressure on the engineers to get something done and ready to fly, you know, and have it go. Uh, we just had another test flight yesterday uh, using the Mastin vehicle, and, and, and like I said, I can't stress enough what a great program uh, Flight Opportunities has been for us. We did our own investment in vision-based navigation, trying to foresee a time when uh, we needed to make transportation to the moon routine uh, and safe. Uh, and you making sure that you landed where you wanted to land and you landed safely where you wanted to land. Uh, so taking that technology, it's been tested uh, most recently, like I said, t yesterday, uh, led to our commercial programs, led to CLIPS, uh, and now we're the participant on multiple teams on the Appendix, on Appendix E. Through all these, not only has the technology evolved, uh, but like I said, uh, Draper's gone from being a, a typical uh, government contractor uh, to someone that that can, in our standard business practice, can do public-private partnerships and pure commercial, uh, which it may not be unique, but it, but it is, you know, we think positions us to be uh, successful uh, and also to support NASA in the goals that they uh, uh, want to achieve. I'll be brief so we can allow for questions. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, so with that, even though we got a late start, it looks like we've got uh, about 17 minutes available for questions. So um, I can hardly see the audience from here. I'm going to stand over there. So, so do we have any questions for our panelists? Ah, over here. Chris, go, 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 go. Right in the middle. Third row. Hi there, thanks for the presentation, Daryl Shook from Amazon Web Services. Um, kind of curious uh, how the India uh, result uh, has affected the, the CLIPS program, how you're reconciling the, re um, the less than perfect success there. Do you want to try that? <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, Camille? for us from a management perspective, I mean, we just know this is hard and it's clear that, um, you know, the, our contractor pool has a, a steep challenge on their hands, but, um, Sherrod, you can just speak. 
Um, I, I think both the um, Space IL and the ISRO missions were huge successes. Um, they introduce um, a great deal of technology and, and um, ad, uh, advancements uh, for commercial, land well, in the case of Space IL, commercial landings. I think our challenge is to learn from those missions, understand what happened, uh, make sure that uh, we don't uh, make the same mistakes. If there are design changes we can make at this stage, we will make those. Um, but I think it, it, we, we've, I felt personally with those, those are huge successes, getting within, for Space Isle to get within 10 kilometers and ISRO to get within two kilometers and potentially they actually did land. Um, I think those were uh, very strong motivators for us to continue our mission and to, and to be the first successful uh, American landing since Apollo. And Seamus? I'm, I'm glad you say it. It was, it was a success. I mean, just imagine how far we've come. You know, you know, ten years ago, five years ago, who would have dreamed, you know, that that a commercial effort, you know, can can get even that far, can get off the earth. You know, when we were doing the Google X Prize, you know, how difficult it was to convince people that this was a doable thing without, you know, necessarily an entire federal program behind it. Uh, so it, it's impressive how far they got. It does remind us that it is difficult. Uh, to complete 100% the entire mission, uh, but I think it motivates us to make sure that that when we go, uh, that that we're successful. And it is representative of the fact that we do identify that this is difficult. We are undertaking a bold challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, we are we are accepting some amount of risk that we typically don't, uh, in the interest of being successful as quickly as possible and doing the right things. I'd also like to point out that LRO. Uh, and, and NASA, we're actually involved with uh, both of those. We have a uh, laser retroflector array on each of those two landers. Um, and now, after the fact, uh, LRO is flying over the sites uh, to try to provide any diagnostics that we possibly can. We've got uh, uh, narrow angle camera imagery. Uh, and matter of fact, uh, during the descent of Chandrayaan 2, uh, the LAMP instrument uh, was observing the changes in the exosphere as a result of the uh, rocket effluence coming down. So we're really eager to see uh, how those uh, observations turn out. Uh, question there. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, good morning. Dan Masnick, NASA Langley. Um, thanks for the, for the overview. Um, we've created a, a debris problem in LEO. Um, hopefully, we're going to have a teeming commercial and, and uh, government um, exploration of the moon. Are there any plans right now to um, control the environment with all the commercial activity? Um, there's been an effort to um, protect the Apollo landing sites, for example, from any sort of contamination or debris. Just some general thoughts on how to do that. Dumping into heliocentric space is one option, but I'm not sure it's uh, necessarily the best option. So right now, the orbital debris uh, requirements that we have uh, do envelop the, the moon as well. Um, I believe that as we're looking at additional trafficability or additional traffic in, in cislunar space, uh, there might be reason to take a look at those plans and approaches and see how they need to be updated. But so far, uh, we're operating on the orbital debris assessment requirements that we currently have. Um, and that goes for the NASA programs. It's very important that there's a distinction here uh, because Whereas uh, we all believe, or we, with our United Nations resolutions, we all agree that orbital debris is a bad thing, right? And we all do agree on how to handle it. But the regulating authority for the commercial entities is actually the Department of Transportation and the FAA. And so they've got very similar requirements, but they're not exactly the same. And so that is something that going forward in the, under this new model we're going to have to look at. Um, gentlemen, would you like to? Uh, yeah, so we began early com communication with the FAA. Um, and with the FCC to get the appropriate licenses. We are complying with the Outer Space Treaty um, and planetary protection, orbital debris. These are all um, uh, plans and, and analyses we have to generate in order to get that license to fly in the first place. And we, we provide all that for our integrated spacecraft, which means all our payloads have to be compliant with that as well. And then we send that to ULA, who would integrate the entire package, submits that to get the launch license. So we're fully aware of all those requirements, and we're going to be compliant with it. And, and in addition to that, I'm sure you did the same. You, we, we've been in communication with NASA about what trajectories we're going to fly, what approaches we're going to fly, you know, uh, any potential plume impingement on uh, artifacts uh, on the moon. 
but I also think it's incredible that a, a question like that could even be, you know, asked. You know, the fact we, we might have considered we might have an, a, the space debris problem around the moon, that we'll have enough spacecraft there, that to, that's something we have to think about is incredible. I think it's great. It is a great problem. Uh, we go. Mike Seraph and NASA headquarters. Um, this is probably for Camille, but um, it, as it pertains to the CLIPS program, um, can you talk a little bit about the strategy as to how um, they enable the success of the 2024 goal? Um, things like um, improving mission safety or mission success probability. There's, there's obvious scientific value here, but um, can you talk about things that are enablers of the 2024 human landing? And then uh, which of those um, objectives within that strategy are potentially so important you might want to put forward more than one uh, of these uh, payloads in case the first one doesn't work or isn't successful? So I'll let Jay talk about the science object, like the importance of the science objectives enabling human landing. Um, but from a s ensuring mission success perspective, we are so much more hands-off than CRS, right? We are literally buying a service. So we don't, um, there's not much we can do in terms of influencing design of the lander per se. We are not enabling development, for example. But there are things that we look for in the proposals that um, help us get a comfort level for success of increasing the success of uh, delivery, right? So um, there's a risk there, but we look for, um, you know, what these guys in terms of their design and their payload integration, how successful the, we think they're gonna be in terms of delivering our um, instruments to the surface. So that's, that's the level of insight, but we, um, there's not much we can do in terms of, you know, enabling their uh, design and influencing that. And uh, Jay, you wanna talk about? Yeah, I would, but I'd like to um, call on Greg here first. Okay, yeah. Um, so we have a, we, we've come up with a reference architecture to help us determine the feasibility on the approaches to the moon, but under Appendix H, uh, these are going to be industry-led designs, and we don't have all the details for those yet, but we recognize the opportunity um, and some of the, the common uh, features of those, such as landing sensors. Um, there's a few sensors that uh, we've been working on uh, in uh, collaboration with STMD um, that, that are going to be flying on... Uh, the, the first two um, missions with astrobotic and intuitive machines. And there's gonna be other, uh, others that we discover and identify. And as it was talked about CLIPS, there's, you know, there's always the opportunity uh, to, to go out with a call once we've identified those sensors. So it's our, we have a task in front of us as we uh, roll into um, and select our Appendix H uh, uh, contractors to identify all those features that can be demonstrated prior to 2024 to, to, to verify, validate the approaches that we have with regards to sensors, algorithms, um, as I said earlier, operational aspects of, of uh, the trajectories and so forth that, that we're going to use for getting to the South Pole. So um, we've identified some. I think there's, there's opportunity to identify more uh, between now and 2024 and have other opportunities for on-ramps. And so I would agree that uh, through the through the instruments that were the instruments and technology demonstrations uh, that we're uh, delivering via the CLIPS program, uh, the technologies can be feed forward into the human lander activities. Uh, we already uh, have identified several uh, that are doing that explicitly, uh, as well as the characterization of you know getting around up there. Right, uh, we've got fantastic imagery down to half meter resolution, uh, but it's really going to be wonderful to have landers over there to get a, a better uh, characterization of the polar regions before human beings go there. Um, additionally, the, um, we're also feeding forward to 2028 in phase two in the sustainability uh, with some of these technology demonstrations as well as the science that we're, that we're engaging in. 
and, uh, and Mr. Rodden? Yeah, and we do, Astrobot does have a separate contract for t terrain relative navigation, uh, which we won through a tipping point NASA tipping point opportunity. That is a technology we're going to fly in Mission 1 uh, as a technology demonstration, not as a, a landing sensor. Uh, but we have the capability, Astrobot has the capability to pursue those type of technologies along with the ones that we fly for our customers uh, at NASA and commercially. So um, we are enabling all those, all those technologies to be proven uh, in advance of the human landings and scaled for human landings. And Seamus, did you? Yeah, the, uh, I think the other thing that should not be discounted is, is there was a comment in the last uh, presentation about workforce. You know, where are we going to get the engineers, you know, you know, you know, where we get the STEM folks, you know, having so many activities now uh, looking at lunar transportation, we're going to have engineers who, a, a good cadre of folks who this is their primary goal, this is their primary work, and just learning how to do this, you know, will, will I think have great benefits uh, to going to, you know, whatever programs come in 24 and all the way to 28. So I don't think it should be discounted that we've gone from, you know, having hardly anybody looking at this to having multiple companies, multiple cadres of folks, people in school who now see these programs and say, I want to be part of that, I want to do that, which I think changes uh, a little bit our workforce environment. And also have the issue of uh, pre-emplacement, right? Yeah. Every kilogram that Greg doesn't have to carry becomes easier for him. And so if we can uh, deposit with uh, multiple clips deliveries, the, the tools for exploration as well as the complex instruments for science uh, to give the astronauts something to assemble, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. Jay, this is for you. This is Andy Crocker from Dynetics. You showed, uh, you mentioned Viper a couple of times in yes. your charts. I wonder if you could speak at all to the schedule that's planned for that. Oh, yeah, certainly. Uh, so we're targeting uh, late 2022 um, uh, uh, delivery uh, for, for Viper. Um, it's a very aggressive schedule. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we are employing um, efficient processes. We're, we're leveraging a lot of the experience, for example, that we had on L-Cross. So we went cradle to grave uh, within two years. Um, and so leveraging streamlining uh, processes, uh, efficient team building, uh, I think, is absolutely key, uh, reducing documentation needs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, of course, we, we've got the on-ramp activity uh, that uh, Camille and I had both mentioned. Um, and so we'll be utilizing, uh, we'll be looking out to CLIPS, right, with the task order coming up at some point uh, for the delivery of, of the Viper. Uh, right now, we're working on you know, how do we define those interfaces, you know, so that we can get a, get a bit out there and, and get her done fast. Uh, yes. Wayne Hale here with a question for Camille and probably follow up from Greg, um, it's, it's, a, it's troublesome to me that in this competitive commercial environment of providers do not want to share anomaly resolution information that could be useful to other people to improve their services. Um, unlike the FAA that's got an anonymous reporting, close call reporting system uh, that NASA actually runs for the FAA, how Will we, in your service-oriented contract, Camille, encourage providers to share information about the problems they've had and, and resolutions so that other people don't repeat those kind of problems? Um, there's nothing, actually, we have now um, established in our process to enable sharing a lot of the um, data, their designs are proprietary, so they, the, our contractor pool is, you know, they're very, um, you know, skittish about sharing information um, in public. Um, and we are not at a point where we could look at past performance because nobody has ever done this before. So that is not something that we can, we can consider right now. Maybe in the future we can as we get a lot more of these under our belt, but that is not something that um, we can consider right now. So, uh, that's that's a good question. Uh, we've got to figure that out. We don't have a good answer yet mm -hmm. either on how to do that. Um, one of the uh, approaches that we're taking is uh, within the NASA 
expertise. There are some lessons learned that, that we have that we can share. Feeding forward, though, with the proprietary nature, um, and, and we had a lot of discussion about data rights and so forth with uh, the companies. It's still not all resolved yet. Um, I, I, I don't know yet. That, that's a good question. I mean, it, it, but we do have, uh, like I said, uh, the first Mighty Eagle flight and first Morpheus flight. We had IMU issues, and John and I talked about that that a lot. And and we that's one of the things that we pass on to our companies like through Lunar Catalyst. Make sure that IMU is vibrationally isolated and properly mounted. So we're, we are feeding lessons learned to the companies, but I don't know how we get um, anomalies uh, resolution from the companies across the other companies yet. Yeah, I don't know that we necessarily do, but, but I do anticipate a lot of papers coming out uh, in the coming years. I, I believe that each of the companies that, that are participating in these commercial activities are very proud of the work that they're doing, and they should be. And I believe that we're going to be seeing more and more um, literature out there. And I, and I think that even just the spirit that all, these, all, that all the players have had so far has been very, very open, very forward-leaning. Uh, so I would honestly anticipate that if anybody had an anomaly, uh, that they'd be glad to get up there and at least operationally talk about the anomaly and what they did and that to, to brag about it. I've seen it in, in uh, I used to be a power system guy, right? And I've seen people open up the, open up the closet a little bit and, uh, and talk about, well, this happened because of this. Not very often, but we'll see. And with that, I think we've just run out of time. I think we, uh, we might oh. have another question. Oh, yeah. Oh, two more? Okay, great. So uh, to Astrobiotic, um, could you talk a bit about who the commercial customers are uh, for your platform? Yeah, we have commercial customers such as the Mexican Space Agency. Um, we have the <clears throat> um, we had Japanese iSpace as a customer uh, for a while. Uh, we have some um, local customers in Pittsburgh. Um, off the top of my head, I can't list all the, all of them, but uh, they range from a simple type of um, uh, marketing type of exp uh, things like uh, time capsules all the way to rovers and science experiments uh, to do more uh, intensive research. Um, and, and that pipeline is very large and it continues to grow. And we believe that as we continue to uh, progress toward flight and then have a successful flight, uh, more and more of those uh, commercial uh, opportunities will, will be released and open to us. And, and, and for us, we also have the marketing opportunities and people want to do branding and things like that. We also have battery technology materials uh, that, that are ideal for long exposure uh, to that they just want to show that their uh, stuff survives uh, through, uh, through periods on the moon. So it, but in all cases, they're small uh, and things that are uh, not integral to the mission but can be demonstrated uh, in the relevant environment uh, but not something we depend on for work. And the wonderful thing that we've been experiencing is that every time we've done something real, every milestone that we've crossed, every RFP that we've released, every task order we've done, the community gets a little bit more of a buzz. People become, well, wait a minute, maybe they're actually doing it. And, and so it's been drumming up customer base. It's been uh, drumming up provider base. Uh, it's actually kind of working as intended. And the fact that NASA is behind this, yeah. you know, is, is a big driver for other customers. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I really have to acknowledge the NASA leadership for, for accepting uh, such a different model. Uh, we've been running fast and furious, and we're accepting risk. Uh, uh, I've got so the last one, oh, there uh, we go. Camille. Um, so knowing that Thomas is right here in front of me, I'm going <laughs> to ask it anyway. Um, to that point, it's been an innovative way of <laughs> it's been an innovative way of putting clips in the science mission directorate and working things this way and collaboratively with HEO. Uh, could you comment, particularly Camille, how this has worked from a management standpoint? Have there been hurdles or has this seemed like uh, to be still an easy management chain for you to work? Well, from, from a JSC perspective and, and a CLIPS project management perspective, we work well. I mean, SMD, we are lockstep with SMD. And we, um, you know, SMD is the one that does kind of the integration across the mission directorates. We don't get to see that much, but from a headquarters center perspective, it's working seamlessly. 
Absolutely, absolutely, <laughs> and th th there is no better compliment that our, that our office could get than a center saying headquarters has been seamless. <laughs> I would like to add from the contractor's perspective that Astrobotic, uh, this model has been fantastic. It's worked really well. Um, it's enabled us to continue maintaining our business model while giving NASA the insight to our program that they need. And we're working very closely with all the payloads uh, on the NASA side to make yeah. sure their payloads, because ultimately our mission is to make science successful and make sure that happens and to make sure that we integrate all the payloads successfully, that we're uh, working side by side with them. It's much like the uh, space station payload integration manager concept. We have payload managers dedicated to each payload to make that successful. All right, thank you to the to Jay and his panelists. Let's give them a applause, please.